chapter 14. We're going to uh, ask ourselves what Peter learned uh, in these experiences described today. So we, we need to read a few of the events that happened and piece them together. So Mark 14, 29 through 31, and then 66 through 72. <clears throat> Actually, I'd like to read from verse uh, 26, should be 26. So Mark 14, verse 26. And when they'd sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice, or three times. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And they came to a place which was, oh, I'm sorry, we'll leave, we'll leave it there and then we, we come across then to uh, the next section, which is in verse 66. So they carried and led the Lord Jesus away. They've taken him into the high priest's house. And then verse 66, as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest, and when he saw Peter, when she saw Peter warming herself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom you speak. And the second time the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. And uh, a little while later, uh, the Lord Jesus, in speaking to his disciples of his of his uh, future plans, and he says to them that uh, they must go and wait for him in Galilee. And when he rises from the dead, he says to his disciples, "You must go and tell them, and uh, and tell Peter, tell Peter." So this is a remarkable history story of Peter and uh, his experience under the Lord Jesus' hands and care and keeping. And uh, one of the things I'd like us to mention here together, first of all, is that uh, much of what happens and unfolds in this history is from a human point of view uh, uh, because something whistled straight past Peter's head, past his ears, uh, when Jesus was telling him something that was very important, he missed it. I don't know what he was thinking about. Uh, you know what it's like. You, you sit there and someone says something 
and you realise your mind was not focused and that it just whistled past you. Whether, whether it was really important for you to know or not, you just have no idea because it's whistled past you. Well, there was something that the Lord Jesus said that whistled straight past Peter. And, uh, and it's here in verse 27. Jesus said unto them, All you shall be offended because of me this night. Okay, that's about where P Peter got to. Everything that follows seems to have just whistled past him. For it is written, said Jesus, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So in other words, this has to actually is going to happen and it must happen because it's going to fulfill prophecy. But Peter missed that. And then he says, but after I'm risen, I'll go before you into Galilee. Well, Peter's not thinking about that either. All Peter's focused on is this statement by Jesus, you're going to be offended because of me. And so Peter immediately responds, doesn't he? Oh, no, Lord, he says in verse 29, in effect, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. So no, no mention there about the smiting of the shepherd. No mention about the scattering of the sheep and how what all is involved. No question to Jesus, Lord, tell us more. Explain to me what that means. It doesn't seem, Lord, to fit with the way I'm thinking. Could you help me? No, nothing like that. It's all just whistled past him. Make sure stuff doesn't whistle past you like that, <laughs> that you really need to have in your mind and stored up for you to explain to you what's happening in your life. I know from experience that sitting in pews, it's easy to have all sorts of stuff just whistle past. Maybe we needed to hear it. Well, Peter had something just whistle past him. So he says, no way, Lord, not me. And uh, so he missed the rest of what Jesus had to say. And uh, the Lord Jesus had quoted actually from Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, where the prophecy is given, I, says the Lord, will smite the shepherd, the sheep shall be scattered. And uh, the Lord Jesus goes on then to say, but I'm going to rise again and I'll go before you into Galilee. That would have really helped Peter. If he'd paused to think, if he'd paused to ask for some more explanation and information, he might actually have been humbled and he might not have had to go through the experience he went through. But he didn't. His pride had taken a hit. And he was put out. How could Jesus think such a thing of me? Seems to be what's going on in his head. How could the Lord Jesus say such a thing about me? Well, Peter's about to learn something about himself that would change that perspective completely. He's going to learn something about himself and his dependence on Jesus Christ and what grace really is. That's actually going to transform him and set him up and make him useful into the future as an apostle. There's a real sense in which what unfolds here, uh, without it, uh, Peter would never have been equipped uh, to be the Apostle Peter uh, that the Lord Jesus later made him. So let's look together at what Peter learned. First of all, about himself. Secondly, about Jesus. And thirdly, about Christ. <laughs> so in this, in this history, in Peter's story, uh, it spans three days. And the events that we've read, uh, they span the time of three days and they go all the way from the Mount of Olives before the Lord Jesus is arrested. And they carry you into the high priest's house where Jesus is being interrogated. And they carry you on to the time after Jesus' resurrection where he sends that message, tell my disciples and Peter. So it's... It, it, it's, it's, it's one of the most uh, intensely focused periods of time and, and, and Peter's history is woven into it. Well, what Peter's going to learn something uh, very profoundly and I'd like to say experientially 
And I'd like you to, if you're taking notes or you're trying to lock onto things to remember, uh, that's an important word I want to put in here. Peter had to learn, but he was going to learn experientially. Uh, he's not going to learn by being taught. He's not going to sit and listen carefully and learn through instruction. It's whistled over his head. He's not going to learn by observation and observing someone else's experience and example. No, he's going to learn it for himself in his own experience. And so I want to say he's going to learn it experientially. Now, now that's really important for every Christian. It's one thing to learn stuff intellectually. It's another thing to observe things in people's lives. It's a whole other thing to experience it ourselves. And, uh, and that's really what Christianity is. It's the things that are true and it's the things that other people experience brought into our own lives so that it actually comes into our own heart and soul. We experience it and it transforms us. And so Peter is going to get that experience. He's going to learn experientially. So first of all, he learns about himself. In verse 29, you get a sense of Peter's uh, amazing self-confidence. This is what he's like as, as a human being in and of himself. He's, he's a very confident fellow. And he says to the Lord Jesus, Though all shall be offended, yet will not I. <laughs> and Luke expands on that as we read, and he says, I'm ready to go with you, Lord, to prison and to death if necessary. Very confident. Confident in himself. Confident in his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ because, because he did have a commitment to Jesus Christ. And he's confident in the strength of that commitment and of himself to stand with the Lord Jesus, come what may. You could say he's resolved in every way to give it everything he's got and he believes that when he gives it everything he's got, it's going to be enough. So then the Lord Jesus Christ's faithfulness uh, is manifest. The Lord Jesus is going to show him uh, what would in fact happen. And so the Lord Jesus responds to him, Peter, Truly I say unto you that this day, and if that wasn't enough, the Lord Jesus goes further and he says, even this night, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times or thrice. In other words, Peter, you, you've got absolutely no experiential acquaintance uh, with how weak you are, how fickle you, your heart really is. You don't know yourself. This is going to happen before the night's even up. And that actually provokes from Peter an even more vehement response. He says, I should, I should die with you and I will not deny you in any wise. <laughs> so, yeah, there's something amazing going on there, isn't there? But Peter's going to have to learn that he's not what he thought he was. Then you also see in the priest's house, you get Peter and John. We don't often think of John being there, but he was there, the disciple that Jesus loved. Uh, he was there, and Peter was following at a distance. And John, we're told in John chapter 18, was known to the high priest. So somewhere or another, there's a connection and an acquaintance there. And John goes into the courtroom of the high priest, where they've taken Jesus, and he leaves Peter standing outside the door. He's outside the door where the doorkeeper, the maid who keeps the door, could see him. And she sees him, takes notice of him. And then in a little while, John returns from inside, and he persuades the maid to let Peter in. And Peter enters. And he joins the group that are warming themselves around a fire in the courtyard. Maybe stands for a while, 
then sits. But that maid has recognised him. And she comes over and she has a good close-up look at his face. She looks at him very intently. And then she says, you can almost sense it in it, she's saying, yeah, I thought so. In, in her mind, yes, I thought that was him. It is him. And she challenges him directly. You were also with Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> Peter is sprung. He thought he was just going to sneak in there unobserved. He thought he's just going to sort of lurk around the fire. Nobody will notice him. He's sprung. He's been found out. And he, according to his character, responds instinctively and he reacts and he says, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. Now that's a very evasive denial, isn't it? He didn't actually outright deny the Lord Jesus. According to Mark's account at that first point, he's evasive, he's sneaky, but it's a denial nonetheless. And immediately, the cock crows the first time. Peter doesn't notice, it seems, that the cock crow. <laughs> but before he can reflect too much on it, Things have a habit of doing like this in life. Before he gets a chance to take stock and reflect on it, another maid sees him. And she, together with a group of men he with, he's with, uh, she says to them, this is one of them. So she's not talking to Peter so much. She's talking to the people around about him. You sort of see a progression here and the pressure building up on him. Uh, now, it's, now it's not just a maid, but it's the whole group around the fire. And the instinct to deny for self-preservation kicks in and it's more powerful now. And again, he denies any association with the Lord Jesus. Peter, what are you doing? But he just doesn't. And the men around the fire say to him, surely you are one of them. Surely you are. You're a Galilean. Your accent shows you to be. Jesus was called disparagingly that Galilean. He's gathered his disciples up. They say to him, this proves you're a follower of Jesus. And this time Peter is completely undone. He begins to curse. And he begins to swear. And he says, I know not this man. Now cursing there is foul language. All sorts of foul language. Australians know lots about foul language. Well, that's a direct violation of the third commandment, isn't it? Peter, Peter is also uh, swearing. Uh, he, he's actually calling on God to observe what's happening, to listen to what he says, and attest to the fact that it's true. Lord, you hear this. I swear by your name that this is truth. I know not the man. Peter's doing, in effect, everything that a sinner could possibly do to preserve himself. <laughs> He's using every deceitful, sinful device at his disposal and is resorted to everything but just to preserve himself. That's a, that's a tragic situation. Everything has come crashing down onto Peter's conscience and the cock crows a second time. And right at that point, the Lord Jesus turns, probably because the scripture says that Peter was in around the fire in the courtyard below so probably the Lord Jesus Christ is in the second tier balcony in the rooms that would have been around there. And the Lord Jesus turns towards Peter and looks upon him, just as the cock crows, locks eyes with Peter. And Peter's heart 
is smitten. And we, we, we are told he goes out and he weeps bitterly. Now, the word that's used there for weep is not to sob in a heartbroken way silently, but it literally means that he breaks out with an outburst of lament from a broken heart, like, like would be uh, with the wailing at the graveside of someone who's died. No more thought of himself. He's gone out and he's just weeping and wailing as his heart breaks. The tears would have been streaming down his face and, and with a heart filled with sorrow and remorse, he just weeps his heart out. What did Peter learn about himself? Well, he's learned experientially that he was not what he thought he was. He, he is very weak. Now, I'd like, like you to please remember that Peter is a true believer. We can't question his faith. Remember his confession? Jesus said, who do, who do you say that I am to his disciples? And Peter, the impetuous one, steps forward and he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And the Lord, and, and the Lord Jesus himself says of him, Well, flesh and blood's not revealed that to you. You've, you've learned that from my Father in heaven. Peter's a believer, no question. Remember Peter in the boat when Jesus is walking on the water and he says to him, Lord, can I come? And Jesus says, yes, come to me. And he steps out of the boat. And as he keeps his eye on the Lord Jesus, he walks on the water. P Peter, Peter has entrusted himself into Jesus Christ's care, has experienced the power of Jesus Christ. He's a believer. And, and he was, even when he was so foolishly assured of himself, he was showing, I believe, a genuine commitment to Jesus and to his cause. It was completely foreign to Peter to think of denying Jesus Christ. It came straight from his heart when he said to Jesus, I'd rather go to jail or death, Lord, than to deny you. For, for Peter, the believer, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, that's the point. And Peter came into the battle with the weakness of his sinful flesh with two major cracks in his armour. There's confusion about Jesus' mission because he missed all those things Jesus was teaching. And there's no awareness experientially of how weak and fickle he is in and of himself. Those are two major cracks in his armour. Now that first one, confusion about Jesus' mission, is important. Because if, if as Peter thought, Jesus' kingdom was going to be a kingdom that's carnal of this world, and it's going to be entered into through physical conflict, and it's going to be an earthly kingdom, then what's happening in the priest's house is completely wrong. How could Jesus give himself up willingly? How could he submit himself into the hands of these priests when he knows they're going to kill him? This is not going to end well. This is not a kingdom being established. Jesus is going to die. And, uh, and Peter is having trouble with that. That doesn't fit. That's not what he's looking for. And so when it comes to having to stand with such a king who's about to die, he starts to think to himself, well, what about me? What about my life? What about my self-preservation? And it all starts to make a bit of sense what, what he's thinking. But there's also this huge crack in his armour about how weak he actually is was in himself. He wasn't aware of how pervasive and how treacherous the sin that was in his own heart really was. He wasn't aware of how cunning Satan is 
who had desired to sift him as wheat. And, and he had no sense, no awareness of his need to pray at this point. Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. No, he's just standing in his own strength. Now, I think we learn a few th very important lessons about ourselves through Peter at this point. I'd like to just touch base with him a little bit. The first one is this. We, we are not strong, brethren, Christians. We are not strong in ourselves. We are weak, weak, weak. You are as weak as water. Now, that's a little bit offensive, I suppose. And I'll say it to myself, self, you are as weak, as weak, as weak can be. You are as weak as water, spiritually. In and of yourself, you are nothing but weakness. We couldn't emphasize that really enough, I think. And that weakness, I say weak, 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 because it's weakness in our constitution as human beings. It's weakness in our character as unique human beings. And it's weakness in our corruption as sinful human beings. Those three things are major, major factors that we as Christians ought to take into consideration. First thing is, we have a tr an awful weakness in our constitution as human beings. Uh, you and I, uh, as Christians too, are, are very weak little bags of dust. That's, that's what we are. I remember a preacher saying once, it's really caught my attention, you're, you're just a little atomite, an adamite. Think of one of those tiny little ants, just a little atomite, just a little bag of dust. God's gathered you up out of the dust. He's breathed life into you. You are completely dependent on another, on God. <laughs> just a little bag of dust. And, and, and when you think about it, any prolonged exposure to an extreme of hunger, of fatigue, weariness, or of fear, or of pain creates within you an inner need, you feel, for relief, for escape. There's something in you that clamors to be delivered. Uh, and, and, and that clamoring demand for escape seeks to take control of your, your choices, the things you choose to do. And there's no greater need that we as human beings ever experience than when we feel that our life is threatened. Something within us goes into overdrive. I've got to get out of this. I've got to be delivered somehow. And in such a moment, the just do it, spontaneous response, challenges in us Christians, the Christ-like self-denial that is required to walk through the suffering in faithfulness. We feel we've got to escape. Well, doing the right thing can be completely overrun at such a time. That's true definitely for Christians. That's why believers are urged time and again to be sober-minded and to watch unto prayer. What a difference it would have made for Peter if at that point when the maid came to him, he had looked at Jesus as soon as the little maid challenged him. And, and we need to realise that all our strength is going to have to come from the Lord Jesus too. If we look to ourselves, we'll be just like Peter. We're just little bags of dust. So the first thing is our human constitution itself is weakness. And the second thing is our characters. The constitution, character. Our characters are flawed. 
Now, of course, we don't like to hear that, and I'm not trying to be rude to anybody. I'm looking at myself when I say that, definitely myself. Our characters are flawed. We, we, we all of us have a unique character with strengths and weaknesses. And, be, and because we're sinners, the effects of sin permeate our whole being, including our character. Uh, we have ingrained flaws in our character because we're sinners. And, and, and those flaws are the things to which we are liable to default instinctively when we're under pressure, just like Peter did. Peter responded immediately, passionately, instinctively, impetuously. That's what he always did. Follow him through the gospel accounts. At every point, Peter is the one who steps forward first. Uh, almost it seeming, seems without thinking. He just immediately hears the thing, responds to the thing. That's his character. That's his strength. But it becomes his weakness because it's flawed. It's affected by sin. Now, that's why as Christians, we're not only concerned about sin and sins, but we're actually concerned about our character flaws as well. And being conformed to the image of God's dear Son is one day are going to bring our unique character traits out of all the disfigurement and weakness and into the beauty of holiness and strength that heaven will reveal. But that's not yet. Here, we're little bags of weak dust who instinctively seek our self-preservation and we are flawed in our character, our instinctive response is almost invariably going to be wrong. And the third thing is our corruption, if that wasn't enough. This is why we're weak. As a Christian, you have a beginning of new obedience. Peter had it. But the beginning of new obedience that we've got as a Christian is just a small beginning. And all the rest, if you imagine a, a, a great big pie graph, and, and there's this little slither of shining, glorious new obedience, and the rest is just blackness. All the rest, apart from this little beginning of new obedience, is the remaining corruptions and what, what we would call the indwelling sins that belong to us <laughs> as fallen creatures. So just a tiny little beginning and all the rest is corruption. And when you think about that, from the point of view of Peter, that's like having to say to ourselves, I, I, according to my innate total depravity, in all my remaining corruptions and with all my character flaws and with my constitutional weakness, I am as, as opposed to Jesus Christ and as suffering with him and for him as it's possible to be. Ever thought about that? Everything about you and me apart from that newness of life and grace that God has given to us in union and communion with Christ, is completely opposed to ever suffering anything for the sake of Jesus Christ. And so you stand with Peter and you say to yourself, Ah, I begin to see. I would have been just the same. I can learn from what Peter did that I am weak constitutionally, in all my character flaws, and in all my remaining corruption, there is no possibility whatsoever of me ever standing in the evil day if I was left to myself. That's what Peter learned. And brethren, we are fooling ourselves if we think we can trust ourselves anymore and Peter could trust himself. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
and I get the impression there that he's saying, as soon as you think that, you are about to fall. Because every Christian has to learn experientially that they're weak if they're going to trust in Jesus Christ, you see. So that's really, really important. Uh, how, 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 how have you learnt that in your life? As a Christian, well, you think back over it. What are the experiences through which Jesus Christ in his providence has led you to realise that you are so desperately weak? We don't like being called weak. don't like feeling weak. But the Lord shows us our weakness. What, what, is, what has the Lord taught you? How did he teach you? Has he taught you yet? Well, what did Peter learn also about Jesus? Well, the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32 said this, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Isn't that marvellous? The Lord Jesus' unwavering faithfulness is so clearly demonstrated to Peter here. He, he learnt about Jesus' faithfulness as the saviour of sinners. The story seems to begin where we started with it, doesn't it? With that conversation between Peter and Jesus in the Mount of Olives. But when you think about it, that story had actually begun previously. It had begun at the throne of grace as a conflict between the desires of Satan and the prayers of Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what uh, Jesus is saying. Satan desired to have you, Peter. This is before. Peter's just launched into his words and, and Jesus looks at him and says to him, no, no, Peter, Satan has already desired to have you. I'm not going to let him have you. I've prayed for you. So it's begun as a conflict at the throne of grace. And Jesus Christ is standing on behalf of Peter and he's praying. Satan has desired him. It's really quite interesting when you think about it. Think about your life and my life. As, as Christians, our lives together. Uh, the spiritual realm is a very real one. Satan and the fallen angels are real. And uh, they're not concerned so much about unbelievers. They're already in their grasp and grip, but they're definitely concerned about believers. And to try and separate a believer from Jesus Christ is the great calling and, and, and really mission of life and reason for existence for, for all the fallen angels. Well, Satan is desired and really... Satan, before he can do anything, has to seek permission. Just like with Job, who, who is represented as a righteous man, Satan going up and down, observing, and he comes to God and he says, I've seen Job. Let me, let me touch him. There's got to be permission. God's in control. Satan's got no ability to even move a finger except he'd be, he'd be given active permission by Almighty God. And everything Satan is able to do and every sin that's ever committed is only permitted in such a way that God is, has no part in the evil and he wisely overrules it and bounds and governs it with all sorts of incredibly wise dealings so that it only ever produces holy ends. So Satan has to ask permission. And there he is. He's asking permission about Peter. And Jesus stands forward. The Christ, the great prophet, priest, and king, and, and Peter's redeemer. And Jesus has opposed his prayer as the prophet to Satan's desire. Now, when you think about Jesus Christ being the prophet, you realize there's two great aspects to his work as prophet. There's what he does in atonement, in paying for our sins. 
which is the complete basis and foundation for the preservation of an imperfect sinner, uh, notwithstanding their sins, in God's favour. The sins are paid for. Blessing is able to continue. Sin cannot destroy because sin has destroyed Christ in the place of the believer. And so God's justice requires the life of the believer. That's the basis in the cross of Christ. But Jesus takes his great victory on the cross and the life of the believer in the righteousness of, uh, of his own obedience and suffering, and he holds it up before God and, and he says to the Father, this soul I've died for and this soul must live. Lord, bless this soul, bless this sinner, bless this saint, keep him, preserve him by your grace, indwell him by your spirit, carry him in your power and love all the way to heaven. And, and that's what maintains the believer. That's it. It's not your strength. It's not what you like in your character. It's not your commitment because it's so weak. It's always broken. It's always falling short. It's Jesus. Peter is learning this. It's Jesus that maintained him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in whom is our hope. And Peter is learning it in a way he could not learn it otherwise because he's learning it as someone who's utterly, utterly ruined everything. And now in the ruination of it all, as his heart breaks and he's weeping from the depths of his, and the core of his being, feeling as if everything has come completely undone, wishing above all things that he could wind the clock back and it had never happened. But it's too late. And realising that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has actually said that if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. And that all comes crashing into his mind and the only, only hope he's got is that what Jesus Christ has done for him might be found faithful. And it is. He learns about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he learns, I think, about the abundant mercy of Christ to erring people, sinners like himself. There comes that decisive moment, doesn't there? I've got to say, I'd, I'd love to have been there and, uh, and been able to understand what was all happening at this moment. But it comes that decisive moment when the cock crows the third time and Jesus turns towards Peter and we're told he looked upon him. And you can only sort of speculate a little bit about the, the pain that must have been in the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was betrayed by a close friend and confidant like Peter was. And you can, you can only really speculate, I think, about the compassion that must have shone in the eyes of the Lord Jesus when he looked on Peter, sort of like a, an awful disappointment mixed with a tremendous sense of pity and compassion. And, uh, and as he looks at, the Lord, at, at Peter and locks eyes with him, I think Peter must have recognised both the awful nature of that betrayal and the incredible depth of the love of the Lord Jesus. And I think that's that depth of the love of the Lord Jesus is reflected or un unfolded perhaps is better uh, when you think of the circumstances that Jesus was in. He's surrounded by cruel enemies. They're all baying for his blood. They're determined to kill him. He's got the prospect that now of that painful scourging, all the unjust accusations and trial, the sense of injustice of it all, which he willingly submitted into. 
all the condemnation falsely for crimes he'd never committed and, and a painful, humiliating death on the cross. All was surrounding him, not to mention even the pains of hell that he'd already in the history experienced in a garden uh, when great drops of blood were pressed from uh, the pores of his skin. Even at that time, he remembers Peter. Peter may have denied Jesus, but Jesus has certainly not denied Peter. That faith union that the Holy Spirit's established between Peter the believer and Jesus Christ the Saviour continues. From Peter's side, it's desperately weak. But from Jesus' side, it's as strong and as mighty as it ever was. Jesus has not for a moment let Peter go. And as the Lord looked upon Peter, at that moment, Peter remembered what Jesus had said and what he himself had done. And it broke his heart. He goes out and he weeps. Brethren, what sort of power is there in the self-sacrificing and constancy of the love of Jesus Christ to break the proud and the sinful heart? What power there is in the love of the Lord Jesus when it breaks in to our darkness, to awaken the conscience, the conscience of an erring saint. If, if once Jesus locks eyes, as it were, with, with a wounded conscience, his compassion and his power will melt the heart and it will draw out the heart after himself in faith and love like nothing else could possibly do. Zechariah talked about that, I think. He said, describing how God will deal with his people through Jesus Christ, he says, I'll pour the spirit of grace and supplications on them. And this is how it's described. They will look upon me, whom they have pierced, betrayed, and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The love of God revealed through Jesus Christ to sinners and to me, the sinner, will melt the heart. It's interesting, isn't it? Judas betrayed Jesus too. But he went out and hanged himself. He never he never beheld with the eyes of faith the Lord Jesus Christ. He never met him, even though he walked with him those three plus years. He never met him experientially as the compassionate saviour of sinners who taught him his need. But Peter, he betrays the Lord Jesus. And he's arrested by the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes out and he weeps bitterly with tears of a broken and contrite heart over the Saviour that is loved and betrayed. What he learned about grace. Luke tells us that when Jesus arose, he said to him, uh, the, the, the messengers, go and tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. Go and tell my disciples and Peter. Peter was in a dreadful position. He's devastated, he's heartbroken, and I think he would have been desolate and despairing even. Jesus had taught very clearly that whosoever shall confess me before men, I, I'm sorry, shall 
Confess me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven, but whoso shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Well, Peter has denied him. And uh, from the point of view of his own experience and his own estimation of, him think, of himself, he is without hope. I've, I've utterly ruined it, must have been his thought. I've denied the Lord, he is going to deny me. And then after that period of time when Jesus had laid in the grave and before uh, this message is sent, Peter must have been, I would think, in sleepless nights and anxious days. And then comes the message. Jesus has risen. I wonder if Peter remembered what had whistled past his head on the third day. I'll, I'll, I'll arise and go before you to Galilee. I wonder if he remembered. But now the message comes. Jesus is risen. And he sends a message to the disciples to gather and wait for him. And he says this, Tell my disciples, and you can imagine Peter with his head hanging down, and Peter, and Peter. What? Me? But I denied him. I don't deserve that. I deserve the opposite. I deserve to be denied by Jesus. I deserve to bear the consequences for such an outrageous wickedness. But Peter gets what he doesn't deserve. In fact, Peter gets from Jesus Christ the exact opposite to what he deserves. Instead of being denied, he gets gathered. Instead of being cast off, he's drawn close. Instead of having Jesus turn away, Jesus looks towards him. Instead of a message, don't let Peter come, Peter is called especially. Now, that's so important. There's a priority, a special priority given of attention for the burdened soul by Jesus Christ. Isn't that marvellous? Tell my disciples, but especially this burdened soul, Peter, he's got a special need, and Jesus' compassion cares for him. Now that's grace. And especially that's the freeness of grace. That freeness of grace, which really comes to us when we deserve the exact opposite, and not only gives a blessing, but so removes out of the way all the obstacles to believing that we're able to come empty-handed. Nothing in my hands I bring. We're able to come empty-handed. In fact, with all the ruination of our life swirling around us, and, and, and we're able to come into the presence of a compassionate Saviour who looks at us and says, come unto me. All you that labour, like Peter laboured. All you that labour and are heavy laden, burdened by all the messed up ruination that you've made of things. And Christians, you too, with, with all the ruination you made last week of life, all the denials implicit of Jesus Christ that swirl around you in all the compromises you made. If Jesus looks at you, and, 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 and touches your heart with his love and you have that sense of complete ruination and unworthiness. It's you to whom he opens his arms and says, come to me. With that labouring, burdened soul, there's a special care in the heart of the Lord Jesus. The love of Christ towards his people in their burden is a very great deep. There will always be an end, Peter, to the burdened soul. There's no bottom to the love of Christ. It's a deep that can never be plumbed. It surpasses every other love as far as the sun exceeds a candle. There's an inexhaustible richness of compassion, a patience and a readiness to forgive that we can't even begin to imagine. And so as with Peter, 
that we should not be afraid to go on trusting him after we've believed and even should we fall very lamentably. No man need ever despair. However far they've fallen, if they'll repent and turn to the Lord Jesus, broken by his love, then he will receive them. If the heart of Jesus was so gracious to Peter, will he not be gracious to you too? So Peter is gathered, but marvellously, and we'll just close with this. Peter wasn't just gathered up and comforted. Peter was equipped. And it was this experience that equipped Peter. The Lord Jesus said in that, in that prayer when he's describing to Peter what's going to happen, Satan's desire to sift you of his wheat, I've prayed for you, that your faith fail not. And then he says, and... When you're converted, that's marvellous, isn't it? When you're converted, strengthen your brethren. Peter writes First and Second Peter, those beautiful books in the New Testament, to the scattered believers. So full of amazing comfort in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who wrote about Jesus Christ from the point of view of the believers. He said, him whom we love. Though we see him not yet believing, we rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory in him because we know him, we love him, we've met him. This is what equipped Peter to be the comforter of the brethren, to strengthen the brethren. He himself had met the compassionate Saviour. He himself was equipped as a man humbled and broken to be able to say to other sinners, you are indeed weak. And yes, you have fallen, but there is not a despair that belongs to you. There is hope that belongs to you because this Jesus who looked at me in that courtyard of that high priest is still the Jesus that we preach. Just like the Apostle Paul who went out to be the missionary and first God put it in his heart to know himself as the chief of sinners so he could always preach free grace through Jesus Christ to the chief of sinners. So Jesus Christ equips Peter to be the apostle who strengthens and comforts his brethren, having experientially learned about himself, about Jesus, and about grace. Amen. Let's pray. Yeah.